Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com for free pe for free premium picks. Look us up in the sports section on Roku. We're there. Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let's get off the PC road for a moment. Let's say I'm seated in a bar. The door is at my back. The bartender is in front of me. He's looking at the crowd and he's looking at the front door. He can see who walks in before I do. There are a few other people, my neighbors, my friends, whatever, at the bar with me, right? We're talking boxing. Bartender knows boxing. Now, let's say the door opens and a stranger walks in. I don't turn around. The bartender looks at who walks in the door and the bartender says, the reigning world heavyweight champion has just walked in. Without turning around, without thinking twice, who do you think the stranger is? Now, I can only speak for myself. You'll have to speak for yourself. But in my opinion, right now, the world champion at heavyweight, given that Vitaly Klitschko has left the sport, is clearly Vladimir Klitschko. Right? He's the top shelf right now in the division. He's the guy who's the champion. Now we can talk about all these alphabet soup, you know, cookie cutter boxing organizations. We can say that this person is the ABC champion, that person is the XYZ champion, but really there's only one people's champ. At heavyweight, that's Vladimir Klitschko. So, let's say you're a nice young man. Your name is Bermain Stavern. And you've just picked up a nice leather or rubber belt from one of these organizations. They've told you that you are their heavyweight champion. Okay, great. Now, let's say you have options on who to fight. They're telling you that your mandatory challenger is unbeaten Deontay Wilder. But you find out through the grapevine, through your promoter, that Vladimir Klitschko wants to fight you. What's your next move? In my opinion, the choice is easy. I would have to say Deontay another time. I'm fighting Vladimir Klitschko. Right? I believe fighters need to go for greatness. If you want to be considered the very best, you have to fight the very best. Right? If you want legitimacy as heavyweight champion, then you have to beat the champion. Right? Let's not have situations where Guys have belts, but they haven't fought the head of their division, right? If most people saw Bermain Stavern right now on the sidewalk, walking down the street, they would think, hey, that's the guy in Vladimir Klitschko's division, right? We remember Buster Douglas because Buster Douglas beat the then reigning heavyweight champion in the minds of the public. Mike Tyson, right? Even now, decades later, even Tyson supporters who believe that Tyson would only lose to Douglas once a year have to concede that Buster Douglas beat Mike Tyson, right? The Tyson supporters understand that they had to call Buster Douglas champ, right? Because he was the champ. I don't care if you've gotten over on a lucky punch or a lucky moment. If you beat the champ, you're the champ. That's the way the sport operates. 
So Bermain Stavern got a nice piece of hardware. But he's not the people's champ at heavyweight. If he's interested in legacy, if he's interested in being the best in his division, in being king, whether it's king for a day, as Buster Douglas was, right? Douglas loses his next fight against Evander Holyfield. Or whether it's king for years. The road to the kingdom goes through Vladimir Klitschko. So, it's my understanding that you can fight one voluntary fight before you fight your mandatory. If that's the case, the decision's an easy one for Bermain's to burn. That voluntary has to be against Vladimir Klitschko. Right? Understand, five years from now, everyone will remember your fight against Vladimir Klitschko. Right? Especially if you beat Klitschko or if you give Klitschko a good match. Right? We still remember David Hayes' match against Vladimir Klitschko. Five years from now, no one is going to remember your match against Deontay Wilder if you don't later beat Vladimir Klitschko. Let me point out, too, that we should feel grateful for the champions who the public understands are the real champs of their division. Right? Because it's only when you beat those fighters that you're then viewed by the public as the kingdom of that domain. Right? Take 168 pounds. If I'm sitting at the bar and the door opens and a guy walks in and the bartender says that guy is the reigning champion at 168 pounds without turning around even with knowing what's happening in the United Kingdom between Carl Froch and George Groves I'm going to know that the champion at 168, the best at 168, is Andre Ward. Right? That doesn't mean that Frotch and Groves aren't going to have a great fight. That doesn't mean that there are guys, that there aren't guys out there who might be able to give Andre all he can handle in the ring. Maybe even beat Andre. But the point is Andre Ward has earned the belt. He's the unbeaten fighter in the division who won the Super 6. No one has beaten him since he picked up the belts. He's the title holder at 168 pounds. I don't need some sanctioning body giving me some explanation about some other fighter who really is a technicality. So if anyone wants to be the best at 168 pounds, and that includes the guy who I think has a great argument that he's the best at 168, James DeGale. That road to that kingdom is going to go through Avenue Andre Ward. Right? If you want to be the best pound for pound in the sport, you're going to have to find a way to dethrone Floyd Mayweather. Right? So, remains to verb. I'm assuming you don't want to be a footnote in history. Right? I'm assuming you actually have joined the sport of boxing, have fought your way up the ranks, have gone from contender to winning an elimination match to now winning a belt. I'm assuming you don't want to stop there. You want to be the best in your division. You want to be kingdom. You want to be the king of your domain. You're going to have to get the keys to the car from Vladimir Klitschko. If, that, if Vladimir Klitschko wants to fight you, and the money is at least as good as you would get from Deontay Wilder, in fact, let me go further. If the money is 90 or 80% of what you would get fighting Deontay Wilder, in my opinion, it's an easy decision.
You need to fight Vladimir Klitschko. Understand, you get paid in your next fight for what you did your last fight. Nothing would make you have more credibility. Nothing would make you wealthier faster than giving Vladimir Klitschko a spirited match. Right? Just food for thought. I'm not saying Bermain Stavern wins that fight, but what I am saying is if you want the gold, then you've got to fight your division's gold standard. And that's Vladimir Klitschko right now, now that his brother has left the sport. Let's talk about another fight. Daniel Gill against Matthew Macklin. I believe this fight is still on. If it's not, then disregard this video. Let me say this. You know, it's not every day that I say that there's a guy out there who should be champ. Right now, understand, if you're watching a fight and one guy knocks the other one down and the other guy can barely make it to his feet, it's not a flash knockdown, it's not a slip, right? It's a legitimate punch, it's not a dirty punch, it's not a low blow. Let's say one fighter hits the canvas, barely beats the count, and I mean barely beats the count, then has to summon every ounce of courage simply to make it out of the round. I believe judges need to call that a 10-8 round. Right now, understand, if all the other rounds in the fight are 10-9 rounds, if there are no knockdowns in the fight other than that knockdown, then understand, to offset a 10-8 round, the fighter who got off the canvas would have to win three more rounds mathematically than the guy who knocked him down to win the fight. Now it still gets my goat. Longtime viewers here online know where I stand on this. But that Daniel Gill, Darren Barker fight, did you, the boxing fan, right, the group that makes boxing possible, did you really believe that Darren Barker outboxed Daniel Gill by three rounds over the remainder of that fight, taking out the 10-8 knockdown round for Gill when Gill knocked down Darren Barker? I didn't see a fight where Darren Barker outboxed Daniel Gill in a 12-round fight by three rounds. Right? Think about it. Right? Let's take away the 10-8 round for a second. Let's consider that fight to be 11 rounds. Right? Just understand that Darren Barker in the 11 rounds would have had to have won 7 of the remaining 11 rounds. A 7-4 margin just to beat Gill by one round on the scorecards. Now I know Darren Barker was at his best, but is that the fight you saw? Factor in the fact that it was Gill's title at stake. And in my opinion, that fight shouldn't have been scored the way it was scored. Right? Tie goes to the champion. And I'm not even sure if it was a tie. Right, I thought Gill won the fight. Well, put another way, Daniel Gill should not have lost his title in a fight in which he did not get knocked down, fought competitively, and scored the only knockdown of the fight. A knockdown that was so dramatic that the announcers were surprised Darren Barker survived the round. I'm sure Darren Barker was surprised he survived the round. Well, let me talk about Gill for a second. There seems to be a lot of misinformation about Daniel Gill. Right? Anthony Mundine after the rematch claimed that he beat Gill by four or five rounds. I have no idea what fight he thought he was in. Right? Roman Carnison, before his fight against Daniel Gill, claimed that Gill moved like an amateur. There again, I have no idea 
who Carmazin thought he was fighting. Carmazin, by the way, gets stopped by Gil in the 12th round. Right? Darren Barker's comments before his fight against Daniel Gill were less than complimentary. Let me tell you, to me, Daniel Gill is one of the more underrated fighters in the sport. He's kind of an outlier. We're in an era right now where elite fighters are getting by on one-twos, right? Vladimir Klitschko. Right, two punch combination. Or, in the case of Floyd Mayweather, things like pull counters. You know, that hard, crisp counter, and then Floyd moves away. Right, but understand, I'm from an era of guys who looked good, didn't want to get hit, but wanted to hit you not with two punch combinations, but five or six punch combinations. Right? Think back to the era of Hector Camacho, better fighter than we remember. Think back to the era of Sugar Ray Leonard. By the way, some diehard people I'm sure are wincing right now remembering their fight, which was well after <laughs> Leonard's prime. But all I'm saying to you is, a good counterpuncher, and I'm not talking about a guy who's a pressure fighter who throws a lot of punches. I'm not talking about James Kirkland or Alfredo Angulo. I'm talking about a guy who picks his spots and then is able to come in with both hands. Right? The kind of gambler who doesn't want to just throw a pot shot, move away, and win the exchange that way, but wants to come in with a fluid combination and naturally has lateral movement to bounce to the side. Because keep in mind, as a counter puncher, when you're throwing both hands, that means you're open for counters, right? If your hands are being used for punches, they're not being used for defense, right? If you like fluid counter punchers who pick their spots, Daniel Gill is one of the very best in the sport, right? He's a combination puncher. He's two-handed. He'll mix up the combination. Right in the middle of a combination, he'll throw two, three left hands back-to-back, -back, come back with the right. Right? He'll throw combinations where he's up top and he's down low. And he's what I call a hoverer. He's not an ambush guy. He's not across the street. Then suddenly he's in your face. Then he's back across the street. No, he jumps in your face, and then he stays in your house. You just don't know what room he's in, right? He's over here throwing a combination. You make the adjustment. He's over here throwing the combination. You make the adjustment. He takes a step back, then suddenly he's back at your front door, right? This guy, quite frankly, would be much more highly thought of if the judges didn't take his title and give it to Darren Barker. I'm not here to say the fight wasn't a close fight. I'm not here to say Barker didn't fight an inspired fight. But understand, had Gill had his belt for the entire period, he would be in the conversation with the other middleweight champions, right? Sergio Martinez, Gennady Golovkin, right? But because he lost the belt to Barker, and then Barker, of course, loses the belt to a guy who Gill already beat in his backyard, Felix Sturm. We view Gill as a face in the crowd, not as an elite guy who should have had his belt the whole way through. Right? I think Gill would beat Peter Quillen, unbeaten Peter Quillen, who has a share of the middleweight title. I would take Gill over Felix Sturm in a rematch. Sturm has a share of the middleweight title. I believe this guy is a championship level guy, and I believe he's going to have simply too much for Matthew Macklin. Macklin used to be a mid-range hooker. Now Macklin is adding certain nuances to his game. 
I thought Macklin's back foot approach to fighting Sergio Martinez is probably the best footage I've come across on a guy giving Martinez problems. Understand? At the end of that fight, after Macklin gets dropped twice in the 11th round, it's late, folks. I believe one of those judges still had that fight 113-113. That was a competitive fight. The problem is a style problem, right? Whereas being on your back foot baffled Sergio Martinez, who likes to have guys come after him. Right? Martinez, like Mayweather, is one of those guys who every opponent seems to think they can bully. Right? Well, understand. If Macklin's on his back foot, that's not going to confuse or deter Daniel Gill. Gill has beaten skilled boxers. He beat Sebastian Sylvester. He beat Felix Sturr. He beat Anthony Mundine. With all due respect to Mundine's delusion, that he won the second fight by four or five rounds. Right? What's going to happen here is I believe the movement and hand speed of Daniel Gill, the fluid combinations, right? The fact that Gill is able to come in and he's throwing punches in bunches, as well as Gill's defense. Understand, Gill has fought tough customers and really apart from the first Mundine fight hasn't really been rung up in any fight right hasn't hit the canvas and looked dazed and confused I think Daniel Gill an underrated fighter he's probably lesser known than Matthew Macklin even though Gill has had the belt or had the belt before the Darren Barker scoring I believe Daniel Gill beats Matthew Macklin Right? I just think Gill's going to have too much movement and too much boxing ability. If Macklin tries to be a mid-range hooker, he's going to have problems with the movement. If Macklin tries to go backward and play it on his back foot, he's going to find that Gill is a hoverer who's going to continue to hang out in his neighborhood and will continue to throw combinations at angles that Macklin won't have the answers for. I like Daniel Gill in that middleweight matchup, I believe we need to look at Gill carefully going forward. I see a lot of big names that Daniel Gill can give a very hard time to. Let me hear from you. If you're a Matthew Macklin believer, make the case here in the comment section to this video. Also, if you believe, personally, that we shouldn't consider Vladimir Klitschko to be the champion at heavyweight. And keep in mind, I'm not saying Klitschko is the best at heavyweight. Far from it. What I am saying is he is the guy with the championship track record. What I'm saying is if I stop 10 people on the street who are into boxing, and I said to them, who's the heavyweight champion? I believe 9 of the 10 would say Vladimir Klitschko. If you're a fighter looking for glory and legitimacy, I believe the way to get that is by fighting Klitschko. If I had a choice between fighting Klitschko, who's had the belt for years, and Deontay Wilder, who's never had the belt, that's an easy choice. The risk-reward is obvious. If I beat Klitschko, I'm immediately one of the biggest stories in the entire sport people 15 years from now or 20 or 30 years from now might be remembering me like we remember Buster Douglas from the early 1990s. The guy who beat Tyson. If I beat Deontay Wilder, who knows what happens? Right? Because Wilder's biggest win to date is what? A win over Malik Scott? A win over Audley Harrison? How do I know Wilder is not going to self-destruct after I beat it? What legacy would that give me? Maybe Wilder is championship level opposition. If so, then the proper path would be to go through Klitschko first. Get the legitimacy from the fan. Have the bartender looking over the shoulder say, 
there's the guy who beat Vladimir Klitschko. Right? Get the bona fides of being a real champion before you fight Deontay Wilder. Let me go one step further. Because Klitschko has belts. Even if the Alphabet Soup organization is going to strip you of your belt, if you agree to fight Vladimir Klitschko, I would go ahead and get stripped. What's the harm? Because I'd be fighting for Klitschko's belts. Right? Either way, if I beat Klitschko, I'm the champion after the fight. Right? So if Klitschko is on your phone calling out your name, you need to answer that call. Let me hear from you. Thanks for stopping by.